right here. Let's have a brief word of prayer. Lord, we, uh, we love you and uh, with what's left of our lives, um, whatever age we are, we, we want to be wise. And uh, speak to us today about that and uh, help us understand the world we live in. in. Jesus' name, amen. All right, we're in Ephesians chapter 5, and uh, we're trying to understand the foolishness of our leaders. Perhaps we'll look at this over two weeks. But as we have seen, and as John MacArthur has been very clear in his teaching, Romans chapter 1 gives us three stages that occur when God abandons a nation. The first stage is that God gives them over to sexual immorality. That's Romans 1 verse 24. The second stage is God gives them over to a widespread acceptance of homosexuality, Romans 1 verse 26. And then the final stage is that God hands them over to a reprobate mind, verse 28. Now the Greek word there that is translated reprobate is adokamos, which means depraved. And more literally, they are unable to pass the test. Isn't that strange? That means the test of rational and moral thinking. Okay, so what specific form of intellectual depravity will, will manifest itself? Verse 21, their thinking became futile. Their foolish hearts were darkened. Although they claimed to be wise, they became fools. So the final stage when God abandons a nation is he hands them over to reprobate, that is evil, minds that are conspicuous for their foolishness. We're now living in a world that is largely run by people who have been given over to foolish thinking. Now, this isn't the first time that this has happened in a nation. Uh, you can go all the way back to Proverbs chapter 26, and that chapter alone has 11 warnings about foolish leaders. Uh, we're certainly not to celebrate them because verse 20, uh, chapter 26 and verse 1 of Proverbs says, honor is not fitting for a fool. So how bad is it when man's minds are given over to foolishness? Well, uh, foolishness, according to the Bible, is the root cause of all conflict in relationships. Uh, foolish leaders will cause, therefore, relationships between nations to fall apart. Proverbs 12, 16 says a fool is hot-tempered, and Proverbs 15, 18 says, and a hot-tempered person stirs up conflict. Consequently, fools will corrupt human relationships and destroy family life. Uh, Job chapter 5, verse 2 just simply says, Fools are a curse to their own household. Proverbs 17, 21 says, To have a fool for a son brings grief. There is no joy for the father of a fool. Fools not only destroy relationships, but of course, foolishness destroys the individual. Uh, Ecclesiastes 2, 4 says, A fool walks in darkness. And so, Proverbs 14, 16 says, A fool is careless and reckless. Therefore, Proverbs 10, verse 8 and verse 20 says, a fool comes to ruin and dies for lack of judgment. Uh, if you ever read the book of Proverbs, it's got 31 chapters and no less than 64 times it warns you not to be a fool with your life. That's more than twice every chapter. Foolishness, sadly, is not a rare commodity among the human species. Arthur Schopenhauer said, the person who writes for fools is always sure of a large audience. Uh, Claude Petit said, the world is full of fools and the person who doesn't want to see it would have to live alone and smash his mirror. <laughs> Romans 1 tells us, it's amazingly, that God can abandon an entire nation to evil and foolish thinking. That's, that's extraordinary. Romans 1, 28, God gave them over to foolish minds. Now, you might think, well, why would God ever do such a thing? And the reason is, is because the entire nation has abandoned him. Romans 1, 21, for although they knew God, the people know there's a God, but they neither glorify him as God nor give thanks to him, but their thinking 
became futile. Their foolish hearts were darkened. Although they claimed to be wise, they became fools. Um, somebody said we fool ourselves so much that we could do it for a living. Proverbs, uh, Psalm sorry, 14 verse 1 tells us, as a verse you know very well, this, that a fool says in his heart that there is no God. So by definition, an atheist is a fool. To which someone would proudly respond and say, well, you know, I, I, I'm not an atheist, I'm a, uh, I, I'm a more reasonable soul, I'm an agnostic. Uh, unaware of the fact that the word agnostic comes from the Latin word ignoramus. Uh, so, when does this foolishness first start to manifest itself in human beings? Now, if you've ever had any children or if you've ever worked with children, you will know that young children, about every 30 seconds, they're doing something so foolish that they could endanger themselves. Uh, my dear mother said that, honey, you knew 20 ways to kill yourself sitting in the high chair. Um, now, notice... Proverbs 22, verse 15, as I read it to you, because it gives us the explanation. It just says, foolishness is bound up in the heart of a child. Uh, notice those words, bound up in the heart. That means that foolishness is bound up in the very nature of a child, telling us that foolishness in this is, is, the, is the best description that you could give or profile of the sinful nature that we are born in, or born with. Um, foolishness, therefore, of course, manifests itself very early in life and has to be very rigorously and biblically trained out of a child. So how do fools who have not had this training, how do they behave? What do we know about them? What does the scripture say? First of all, God says you can't teach them spiritual truth. Proverbs 1, seven says, fools despise wisdom and instruction. And of course, that's talking about divine instruction, God's word, uh, even if it's very logical, even if it's very rational. You all know that my wife's been out of town as I've been preparing the place for her. We've moved to a new location and I, I, I bought a few new fish to replace the ones that uh, uh, went to fishy heaven uh, as a result of the move. But uh, I bought a few uh, new fish and the young lady who was very pleasantly assisting me, she was telling me how you can tell whether they're male or female. And so I said, well, so you can tell if they're male or female entirely on the basis of their physical attributes? To which she said, oh yes, absolutely. And so I asked, well, why do you suppose that people are now asserting that you cannot tell whether human beings are male or female solely on the basis of physical attributes? She became immediately very standoffish, if not hostile towards me, because clearly she thought otherwise. Um, as I was leaving, and possibly because she imagined I might be a Christian, and her wanting to get the last word in it, she blurted out, she said, well, you know, you probably think that human beings are different and superior to animals. Well, I'm telling you, they're not. They're just animals, to which I replied, well, of course, that belief would give people the excuse to behave like animals. And then I thought, probably better leave, uh, because uh, um, if we continue to the subject, we might start to get to verbal blows. And uh, now let's be honest, I don't really know this woman and I can't evaluate her from this small encounter. But I can return us to the biblical truth and that is that you cannot teach a fool spiritual truth. It doesn't matter how logical it is. It doesn't matter how rational it is. As Proverbs chapter 1 and 7 says, they despise wisdom and instruction. Uh, the Apostle Paul says they're forever learning and never able to come to the knowledge of the truth. And Proverbs 14, 9 says, they're never going to be able to improve regarding their lives because fools make a mock at making amends for sin. Why would they ever do that? Well, there's a very simple answer. It's given in Proverbs 10, 23. It's because a fool finds pleasure in evil conduct. So unbelievers, they can't find God. They, they mock his truth. And like all fools, they 
confidently imagine that all wisdom is to be measured by the yardstick of their own opinions. Uh, in fact, Proverbs 18 verse 2 says, A fool finds no pleasure in understanding, but rather delights in sharing their own opinions. And that's because Proverbs 12 25 says, The way of a fool seems right to him. But by contrast, a wise man listens to advice. Uh, Bertrand Russell said, uh, the whole problem with the world is that fools and fanatics are always so certain of themselves, whereas wise people are often plagued with doubts. Um, so what does God tell us to do about fools? How do we respond to them? Well, um, there's two things that the Bible focuses on. One, of course, is how to deal with them, and primarily that is to how to avoid them. Um, Matt Lydian said that when you see a fool, it'd be wise to change your path as if you've seen a wild bear in the forest. Uh, perhaps I'll look at that next week. But uh, the other thing God speaks about in the scriptures to his children is, is to focus rather more on making sure that we're not also foolish. And we'll look at that in the next few moments. You know, it's, it's a tragedy that, that religious people can be just as foolish, if not even more foolish, than sinners. Uh, so let's look at some of the verses where God actually uses the word fool when he's describing religious people and churchgoers. Um, there's the churchgoer who, who's never personally invested in the kingdom of God. In Luke 12, 20, verse 20 and 21, Jesus talks about the man who who his whole life invested in his retirement. Sounds very good, sounds very wise. Ah, but you see, he never invested in God's kingdom. And God said to him, you fool, this very night your life will be demanded of you, then who will get what you saved up for yourself? This is how it will be for anyone who stores up things for himself but is not rich towards God. Uh, then there's the church person who only came to listen, loved hearing sermons, uh, uplifting sermons, and maybe even hearing sermons about, 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 about how horrible they are. You know, they, they, they don't feel they can get through the week unless, unless um, they get a good beating on Sundays. Who knows what their preference is? But they go to listen. They just have no intention of doing anything about anything they might hear. In Matthew 7, 26, Jesus said, Anyone who, everyone who hears these words of mine and does not put them into practice is like a foolish man who built his house on the sand and the rain came down and the streams rose and the winds blew and beat against the house and it fell with a great crash. Then there's the churchgoer who was a very committed church person, who was, who was involved in ministry. The only problem was is they were never born again. Uh, Matthew 13, 20 talks about the man who hears the word and at once receives it with joy, loves to hear preaching. But since he has no root, since he was never saved, he lasts only a short time ago. You know, a number of years ago, uh, we had a regular attender at this church, really it was quite a few years ago, who, who, who would even come regularly to the house group that we that met weekly in those days. And... Uh, Around whatever year that was, we decided to, on different weeks, give different people an opportunity to share their testimony. So one week it was her chance to give her testimony, um, which she did, and managed to do so without ever mentioning Jesus, without ever mentioning God, without ever mentioning the scripture, without ever mentioning a, a conversion experience. It was just a, a, an autobiography. Later she quit the church, phoning me up and saying, look, I, I'm not coming back here anymore, and I want to tell you what bothers me. Uh, I, I just don't want to keep coming and hearing that Jesus is Lord and that he's, uh, he's still on his throne. She said, if that's true, I, I don't like the way he's running the universe. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay, there's no answer to that, is there? Um, then, of course, you, you read the scriptures of the, what the scriptures call the foolish virgins who actually waiting, actively waiting on Jesus' return, and yet they had never bothered to see that they had the oil of the Holy Spirit themselves. Uh, there's the church member who 
takes great pains to appear holy, but only to appear holy. Luke eleven thirty nine. 39, and the Lord said to him, now then you Pharisees, you clean the outside of the cup and the dish, but inside you're full of greed and wickedness. You foolish people. Did not the one who made the outside make the inside also? You know, maybe we comfort ourselves by saying, well, you know, I only indulge in um, the occasional moral foolishness. Ecclesiastes 10.1 says, As dead flies give perfume a bad smell, so a little foolishness outweighs wisdom and honor. So that brings us to our text, <laughs> Ephesians 5. I've never left the text that we're to look at so late, but here we have it. Uh, we're in Ephesians chapter 5, verse 17, and it tells you how to avoid being foolish. How, how do I not develop a depraved mind? Uh, a repro a, a part of my mind becoming reprobate. Um, notice what Ephesians 5.17 says. It says, therefore do not be foolish. Okay, so how? But understand what the will of the Lord is. So the first thing is, if you don't want to be foolish, if you don't want to go down that road, then the first thing is, Lower your praise for your own wisdom. Abandon, in fact, your own will and your own wisdom. You have to let go of your own will, which is here described as foolishness. That's God's, that's God's opinion of your opinions. Uh, 1 Corinthians 3.18 says the same thing. He says, don't deceive yourselves. If anyone thinks he's wise by the standards of this age, well then let him first become a fool that's what he really is so that he may become wise you abandon your wisdom so that you might do, you might might start to uh, sit at the feet of God's wisdom you know when you're a preacher one of the best pieces of advice is that I that I that I ever got was when you go to a text don't go there knowing anything don't go there with a whole catalog of prejudices and, and beliefs and what you want it to say and and what you've heard it meant uh, just go there as completely as a student and then sit at the feet of that text and see how it talks to you afresh. Start by recognizing that your wisdom is foolishness. Lay it aside, and until you do, that text says you're not going to become wise. You cannot know God or God's will by following your own wisdom. In fact, 1 Corinthians 1.21 says, the world through its wisdom did not know God. So lay it aside. What's the second thing I need to do? Then find out what God's will is for you. Look at verse 17. Therefore, do not be unwise, do not be foolish, but understand what the will of the Lord is. How do believers become fools? You know how? They do the opposite of that. In Jeremiah chapter 4, verse 22, God says, My, my people are fools, comma, they don't know me. You see, what happened? They just drifted from God. Most of the times when this happens with genuine believers is that they don't know they've drifted from God. They, but they've drifted from him because they've drifted from his word. Um, maybe they joined a church, uh, and they joined it because it had all these wonderful programs in it disregarding the fact that the teaching of the word of God was very weak there. And so they drift and they become morally foolish. Um, Second Peter chapter one, verse 19, Peter tells us uh, that he, that we have the word of the prophets made more certain, and he's talking about an audible voice from God. He said, but, and you would be wise to pay attention to it. The opposite of foolishness. So how do you prevent yourself from drifting for, from God's word into foolishness? Um, is, is there something specifically that I should know? Ecclesiastes chapter 5 verse 1 says, Guard your steps when you go into the house of the Lord. Go near to listen rather than to offer the sacrifice of fools, which is clearly people who are not really listening who do not know that they do wrong. So commit to going to church in order to listen for what God is going to say to you. 
Don't go just to listen to the sermon. Oh, that was a nice sermon. That wasn't his best. That was pretty good. Oh, I like that one. That was a funny one. You know, people go to church and they, that, that's all they get out of it. But they don't, they're not listening which, for what God is saying to them. And God can speak to you through the crummiest of sermons ever. Things that were poorly constructed. A, a person with very little teaching ability. But if he's called by God to do it, you can have a life-changing word from God through it. Otherwise, of course, the effort you're making to drag yourself to church is, is what God calls the sacrifice of fools. And notice that there are millions who, who just go to church to say that they've done it. And the text says they don't know that they do wrong. So commit to listening. What is God saying to me? And then, of course, commit immediately to doing whatever God is saying to you. Ecclesiastes 5, 4 says, when you make a vow to God, do not delay in f fulfilling it. He has no pleasure in fools. Don't listen to the sermon. Hear what God's saying to you and go, I need to start doing that. And then just go back to your old ways. Proverbs 26, verse 11 says, as a dog returns to its vomit, so a fool repeats his folly. So abandon your will. I'm not so smart. Lord, what do I know? Uh, and then find out what God's will is for you. Uh, determine to do it, to implement it. And then in implementing it, choose a path that avoids temptation. Temptation, what do you mean? Temptation to violate or digress from God's will. Notice verse 15. Be careful how you live or see that you walk carefully. King James says, see that you walk circumspectly, which means very carefully. Proverbs 14, 16 says, a wise man fears the Lord, and so he shuns evil. He voids it like the plague that it is. But a fool is hot-headed and reckless. When it comes to a fool's behavior, they just walk straight back into the same temptations. Well, how do you walk carefully? Hebrews 12, 13 says, make level paths for your feet so that you don't trip up. Choose a path that isn't going to trip you up. One that isn't plagued with the very things, the very temptations that you fall for. Uh, you could add to that. Uh, when you're going down this temptation-free path, or at least the most free path that you can, you can negotiate, um, be careful who you go down the path with. Proverbs 13, 20 says, He who walks with the wise grows wise, but the companions of fools suffers harm. You all know 1 Corinthians 15, 33, which says, Don't be misled. Bad company corrupts good character. So choose your path wisely. Choose your partners wisely. Choose your pleasures wisely. It's interesting that Ecclesiastes 7.4 says the heart of fools is in the house of pleasure. They're pleasure seekers. It's very easy to choose a path tempted by whatever gives me the most pleasure. Uh, you've got to be careful with that. Finally, and by way probably of summary, choose a path that prioritizes doing God's will for that day. Maybe it's just something you know God wants you to get done. Choose a path that's going to make that most likely to happen. Be very careful then how you live, not as unwise but as wise, making the most of every opportunity because the days are evil. It, it, the Greek literally doesn't say that. It says redeeming the time because the days are evil. If you're going to be wise, you've got to recognize how much time you've got left. You know, if, if you're preaching this to 18 and 20-year-olds, they just look at you with a gaze. I got all the time in the world. They, they think they're going to live forever. Um, they hear old people say, well, life's so short, passes by so quickly. And so they, they, this, it's, it's hard for them to grasp this. But, but I think we're uh, less able to give an excuse for not paying attention to what is becoming a pressing truth 
And that is we have to recognize the time that we have and how we're going to use it for God. Psalm 90 verse 12 says, is a prayer and it says, Teach us, Lord, to number our days aright that we may gain a heart of wisdom. But Ecclesiastes chapter 4 verse 5 says, The fool folds his hands and ruins himself. There's no urgency about the time that he has. You know, um, I'm 65 this year. And if God allows me to live to the ripe old age of 84, uh, and by the way, the average lifespan of an American is 78. So if you're past that, you're, you're on borrowed time. Um, but if he allows me to live to the ripe old age of 84, I've got a little over 7,000 days left. And, and, and as I become aware of this, you know, you think, how am I going to use your time for you, Lord? i got a whole of eternity. I don't want to spend it regretting that I didn't finish strong. Redeem the time. Abandon your will. Find out what God's will for you is. Determine to do it. Choose a path that prioritizes doing his will, that avoids temptation. And down that path, as we mentioned in a whole sermon before, use the opportunities that God presents to you as you go down life's journey uh, making the most of every opportunity because the days are evil. Um, opportunities to do what? Opportunities to serve those around you. What did Jesus do? Just constantly looking for what, not just people in need, he would look for the opportunity that God had presented him to minister to. And sometimes he'd walk through a whole crowd of people and leave them all, and just go to the one person God had said, that's the person you do minister to and opportunities to talk to others about our faith. Um, what was the Lord doing? Every, everywhere was, a, whether he's by the well, talking to a, a, a woman whose life was not what it should be, whether he's talking before soldiers who had come to arrest him, whether he's before a large crowd, he is a fountainhead of truth about the kingdom of God. Well, yeah, but I don't know my Bible well enough to do it. Well, well, then tell them what God... Listen to their problems and then say when you've heard them and paid the respect to hear them, then tell them, well, let me tell you what God's done for me. And you say, well, I don't even know if I could do that. Well, here's what you could do. You, the simplest way to get into sharing your faith or to, or to being out, involved in outreach is to do what the uh, disciples did in John chapter 1. And that was to... Uh, just say, come and see. Remember that? They found Nathaniel and they said, well, you know, a good thing could come out of there. And he said, come and see. Just invite him to church. Say, we'll do lunch afterwards. You never know. Um, finally, there's only one kind of fool that you should aim to be, and that's a fool for Christ. Um, the former congressman, Brooke Hayes, he, he told a story. It's a true story about a preacher who advised a politician who was looking for some sort of enlightenment to go out, he told him to go out and stand in the rain and then lift your head heavenwards, and he says, and it will bring revelation to you. Well, the next day the politician returned and he said, you know, I followed your advice and no revelation came. And, and, and the water just poured all over my head and down my neck and I, and I felt like a total fool. Well, said the preacher, that's quite a revelation for the first time. <laughs> um, folks, instead of let's just spending the rest of our lives just getting all grief-stricken about um, how foolish our leaders are, let's also turn one eye towards ourselves and say, Lord, I'm, don't allow me to, to be the same. Um, Increasingly, may we lean less and less on our own wisdom and judgment and more and more on God's wisdom and God's word. And so as the world becomes more and more reprobate and depraved and foolish in its thinking, we become more righteous and wise in ours. Let's pray.